So this has been quite a day. I got here at uh, 1 o'clock, and uh, when it kicked off, and I'm glad I didn't miss uh, a lick of what's all gone on. It's, um, it's been fascinating. And no, it's not a problem. Um, so I'm uh, Dudley Cock, and I got started on uh, figuring out writing this play when uh, a buddy of mine, uh, Don Baker, from The Pound, many of you probably know Mrs. Baker, she was Catherine Baker, she was a school teacher for years, and uh, anyway, Don and I were friends, and I was living up the Shenandoah Valley uh, in Stanton, Virginia, and I was living in a big, fancy <coughs> house, uh, not because I was rich, but because I needed a place to stay, and a woman living out in the country had just inherited this big fancy house. And so the idea was I was sure she was going to move into the big fancy house from her double wide out in the county. So I thought I'll go knock on her door and tell her, well, as you move into the big fancy house, I'll take the double wide. So I pulled up in my pickup truck. As you would expect, the chickens were scattering. And I said, you know, great. You're moving into the big town now, and I'll take your double wide and pay rent. And she said, Lord, no, honey. I'll not move in with them fancy people for nothing. Yeah. So I ended up in this big fancy house. Well, the house had a workshop that ran the whole length of the house, and it had a two-car garage. So my buddy Don and I, we had, didn't have much money, and our cars weren't working that well. So we decided that we were going to repair our cars because of the workshop and the two garage. So Don would come up on the weekends. Now, I can tell you, if you know Stanton, Virginia, this is on Beverly Street, just down from the Woodrow Wilson. Well, they were not that happy about seeing these two cars up on blocks, but <laughs> we needed transportation. So uh, we got to working on that, and Don was down here. He'd grown up with Frankie and uh, Gary Slemp, the other uh, actor and originators of the play and uh, so he said look I'm, I'm working on this play I want you to come help me do the research and so forth and I said okay um, I'll help you do that and we'll go back and forth between the cars and working on the play <laughs> so that's that's what we did and um, it if we got the play finished and I said, well, Don, I'm going back up to Stanton to keep working on the car. And he said, no. He said, uh, now that we've written the play, we have to start a theater company because nobody else <laughs> will produce it. <laughs> and he was right. So that's when Frankie <laughs> starts joining uh, the gang, the Red Fox gang, and we start uh, rehearsing the play. You want to pick anything up no. from there? <laughs> <laughs> no. So when Fred's there, I, uh, well, the, the play that we did, if we had included all of your details, Mr. Baldwin, it would have, it would have gone on for days. I guess. <laughs> Let me, let me just say, I mean, it's really nice to be here and, uh, you know, to be with folks that really, um, you know, care about <coughs> these mountains and the things that happened here and to keep that going. It's uh, very touching. As I'm, I'm moved by just being in this building right here because this is the kind of place where we used to do the show sometimes. Uh, one time over Brumbley Gap, <coughs> a place called the Coon Club, just like this, and um, so um, I miss those guys, 
don't see Don much. Miss Gary every day, and uh, so it was. Uh, <coughs> it was a great time, a lot of fun. Um, the beginning of it, actually, uh, you know, because there were three guys. Well, at that time, there were about five people, maybe, and a couple people left. Jeff Kaiser, uh, a great actor <coughs> who lives over near Marion now. Um, he was in the show, Don and, and, and Jeff and I. And a lot of the feel for the show, the timing, the rhythm, a whole lot of things came from Jeff Kaiser. And uh, But he went off, joined the Army, and then Gary Slimp came in. And, um, and Gary Slimp was a, a trained, great, great actor. Uh, had George C. Scott's blood in his veins and uh, so but it was difficult because um, you know Don had been working with a, a small group of people at Apple Shop telling some uh, like Jack tales and and it was probably his idea to tell them together break them up break the sentences up and tell them in unison but it's hard to do and, and make it sound natural and it was uh, and it was really hard for us to do, um, and, um, and it <coughs> took a long time. And but that's what it was like in the beginning was just working on stuff. And unfortunately, we were part of Apple Shop, uh, and there was uh, money available for us to keep going. You know, a lot of theater if it doesn't do good in its first couple of weeks, it folds and that's it. But we kept doing the show and. Uh, and Dudley, we would do a show, and he would say, well, you know what you all did, this right here, that like really worked really good. So he kind of worked that into the show, and that took time. And so we had a lot of time to kind of polish it up, I guess. And um, I, uh, lots of different places, you know, where we did the show. We did it in some prisons, we did it in a lot of colleges, theater group, uh, New York City a couple of times, and, you know, real kind of, you know, experienced audiences, so to speak, and uh, did a whole bunch of shows. And I've often wondered um, why people, people really liked the show. They did. Uh, no matter where we were and I think it was because we were having a good time and that um, it was kind of interesting that talking kind of thing that we did it was like they uh, at first it just looked like three old <coughs> mountain boys just up there talking you know and then after a while it was like <coughs> No, they do this every night. It's rehearsed. They don't change. They don't miss a beat. It, you know, then it became something else for them. And <clears throat> so that was fun. But, um, you know, we I remember doing the show up in Vermont. And um, there was something about that part of the country. And the people liked the show. But I think one of the reasons why everybody liked it is because it was so local. It was easy for them to imagine that where they lived in some little town in Vermont, or face some place in Utah that where they lived, whatever, and where there are kind of legendary, colorful characters, and you know, with something but people gossip about stories that they tell or something like that. That's just kind of contained in their little community. That that's what these guys here were doing. They were just talking about some local you know, where they lived, and it, it made them appreciate in a different way where they were from, and, that, and it was like, oh, we, we, could, we could see something like that here. We, we could do this, and um, um, so that was pretty special, and, uh, you know, to be part of that. And, I mean, that's the way I looked at it. Uh, up in New York City, they thought we were really good actors because we maintained that accent so well. <laughs> right, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, that was that was. Uh, Let me tell you a little story about how we uh, got to uh, New York. 
Um, we were, we was just like Frankie said, we would, we would be performing exactly in a place like this. And then when the weather had warm up, we went and uh, bought a, a used uh, revival tent, gospel revival tent. So we'd pack that tent up a holler and pitch it, go around of the day and tell people come on over and there we'd do the show in the tent. We'd do a little free show for uh, Mount Tales in the afternoon for the kids. But then the evening, everybody pack in to hear this story. Well, I can remember many a time, Frankie and uh, Gary and Don would be uh, in the middle of the play and someone like Mr. Baldwin would just stand up and say, well, I've got a piece of information that you, know, you, you all need to know. And so the actors would pause, and Mr. Baldwin would tell what the information was, and then I was back there running all the slides, projections, and lights, and I'd have to, you know, sort of stage whisper, this is where you were in the script. <laughs> and, they, and they'd think, so that's, and then if, if the information was good and we could verify it, because we were very much into making a docudrama. So the big breakthrough, was when we found the old court uh, records up in the attic, the records from the trial. And when you did a trial, you didn't do a literal transcript back then. Uh, notes were taken and both the prosecution and the defense had to agree and sign that this is essentially what happened. So when we found that, that really gave us a lot of facts to, and then we went to the newspaper morgues and so forth. But the source of the story was right here, uh, just as Marley said, just talking to everybody. And, and we thought of ourselves as sort of investigative reporters. So we would hear one thing from somebody, somebody like you, and then we get, do you have somebody we can talk to more about that? Then we would, and that's how we started uh, piecing the story together. Like Frankie said earlier, <coughs> Uh, the first performances were like four hours and something, and it wore people out because we <laughs> we had so much information, and and we weren't very good. Really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, between the two, uh, that was that's about it. So, um, so that's it. so. Hey, I was going to say how we got to New York. So we were we were perfectly happy going into these uh, into our tent in the summer and performing in a place like this uh, but we couldn't uh, you know get enough money to keep going and the reason we couldn't get enough money is because the Kentucky Arts Commission where we were incorporated over there in Whitesburg they said uh, every time we would apply they would say it's impossible that any theater of any count could occur anywhere east of Louisville, sometimes we fund Lexington. So, you know, they just wouldn't give us any money uh, to do what we're doing. So that made us mad. And so we called somebody up in New York because I was beginning to figure that the shortest route to Frankfurt might be through New York City. <laughs> so we went up to New York City and the play took off. And then the people in Frankfurt had to get on an airplane to find out what in tarnation was going on. <laughs> That's how we got to New York. <laughs> and it was in New York where Frankie made a, uh, a amazing, uh, uh, he realized something about New York, which I've never forgotten. Somebody would say, well, Frankie, what was it like in New York? And he would look at them and say, it's where the tall meet the short. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting older, but I do not remember that. <laughs> I don't remember that. It's a tall story. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't remember oh, that. I, uh, so I... Uh, The last performance that you did? I think the very, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure Dudley will probably. Ernie, you were there, right? Yeah, it, was, it, was at, it was at the Wiles County, yeah. in front of the Wiles County Courthouse, out on the lawn, and it was a little bit of the It was, um, the, you saw the, the, the jail and the courthouse beside where Doc would have come yeah. out in the window there. So that was in the background. We had a, a big screen where we had slides of old pictures that we showed, but there was still a lot of that. <coughs> and then, so we were kind of uh, on a little bit of a stage right there, and they had blocked traffic off all of the main street of Wise and put seating out there, you know. Mm -hmm. So you got those beautiful old maple trees around and lights and things, so it was pretty special. But I couldn't recall because there was a time close to that when the Pound Historical Society had sponsored a show out here at the, at the school, and that was one of our last shows. Paul Cusco kind of helped bring those shows That's together. That's all 40s, J.W. Adams, all 40s. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. And, uh, I just remember it was a huge crowd. I mean, you all got out a lot of people for that, and uh, uh, and it, it was a great show. Uh, uh, I remember afterwards talking to some people, and there were family members of some of the people that we talk about who I must have been killed because they brought some clothes, a shirt with blood stains on it that had been kept in their family. All these years. That, that shirt was supposed to be here today. I talked to the gentleman that owns it on Facebook, and he couldn't make it. He was going to bring Ira Ira Mullins' shirt, the blood stain shirt, today to show us. Let me ask you this: uh, They used to do the Pound Gap Massacre over in Big Stone Gap at the Jean Pauver Theater. Were y'all ever involved with that process? I think up until the '90s they stopped doing it. And I guess two questions: Why? I wonder why they stopped. So we weren't a part of it, but we were a part of it in the sense that when we uh, started working on this play, we of course knew John Fox Jr.'s Trail of the Lonesome Pine, which, you know, John Fox Jr. had come in here as an industrialist to make a lot of money. Well, when the boom busted, he turned to writing, and Trail of the Lonesome Pine was the first million seller novel in the country. So when we were starting on this play, we were thinking, well, you know, <laughs> how, how true is this John Fox Jr. story? Of course, you know, in the John Fox Jr. story, the industrialists, the coal timber men who come in here are the heroes, and people like Red Fox, M.B. Taylor, <laughs> well, they're the villain. So, we, you know, that's how we all knew that story, and that's, that's where we got going. But when we found the court records, uh, uh, transcripts up at the courthouse, it just, it just turned Fox's story upside down. It just wasn't true. And, we, and then we got into the newspaper work from archive more, and we just had fact after fact. And it turned out that uh, Fox's story was uh, just a fabrication yeah. um, for their own purposes. And uh, so that, that was the extent of that. So Didn't I hear somebody say that somebody's rewriting the story? Yes. There was a gentleman rewriting the story. And he has contacted me to find out what information I have about what Red Fox did after the killing. They claim to, they claim to have that play at the Red Shepherd Street Inn. Right. Oh, okay. When he gets through writing. Right. Good. He's going to play this summer, I believe. Yeah. The summer? Yeah, I think there's one, there's one question. The summer. Where are the transcripts of the trial? Uh, are they still in existence, or somebody has put them in a book? Or? No, they're they're not in existence that I know. Um, I'd have to ask Don, but we, you know, we had them and used them for to create the play, and uh, then they were returned. Of course, we couldn't take them out of the courthouse. Yeah. And so the question was, what happened to them at the courthouse? Yeah. Yeah, and um, so we've not uh, found them. 
since then. Now, the our story came out of rooms like this, people who actually knew something about the story. And it was pretty uh, amazing when you see a people's story, your all story, overturn the official story. That was, that was remarkable. And that caught, like Frankie said, a lot of people's attention when we would tour this around the United States because they had local stories too and it was an affirmation that local life counted for something that it that their story wasn't going to always be written by someone somewhere else and so that would that was really important and then there were two things in the story that we were uh, that we never were able to come to a conclusion about one was who actually informed on Taylor leading to his arrest in Bluefield. Somebody told on him, and we never could um, find out who. Though somebody just like you sitting here after we did a performance came up to us and said, and this was somebody from Wise County or Dickinson County, said, I know who it is, and this was like, you know, 80, 90 years later, I know who it is, but it's too soon to tell. <laughs> Did you all have uh, an opinion based on your research about the controversial question of whether Red Fox, Scott Taylor, actually hang and wise or not? Did you all have, I, I know nobody knows absolutely sure about that, but would you, you have think? an opinion based on your research? Well, I'd like I was referring to Mr. Baldwin with a lot of details that we didn't, that we never, you know, dealt with in the beginning. I, uh, I think at the end of the show, uh, we kind of left that up and it, did this happen or did this that happen, you know? And I, uh, I never really, we know I didn't. It was a big job driving around the country and putting on this show in the first place. <laughs> and I, you know, so we, uh, I don't remember that we would, you know, too. I had a little bit different question, I think. Uh, in my research, in my, in my knowledge of books, uh, and, uh, and like I say, I try to be as honest as I can because I'm known Fleming and was sure. related to Doc Taylor, so I'm trying to keep it on. <laughs> but the man I only know, there was like several thousand people outside that waited and got in the grave went to his home and followed his wagon and his horse or his, his pastor. He, he requested to have that open for three days because he was going to raise from the dead. So I imagine after three days, his body probably started swelling. Right. And some right. of those yeah. people had to have seen that in order to bury him. And so for, for me, being in law enforcement, when you have so many thousands of people that close, somebody there have been a lot of people said that ain't him, that's a log, or he's not there. They, I think that would spread like wildfire to me. I personally think his neck was broke and he swelled up, and after three days, he started stinking and ate right. the crap. Yeah. Which is great. Right. That's right. Now yeah. that's what I personally believe. It's only because it, it was his request to leave it open for three days and he was going to sit down. Now, that, the fact that you took that out of the equation, and he dropped and nobody saw him, and he went in the box and no one opened the box and they put him in the ground. Then, to me, I think there'd be some suspicion. But to follow, you remember how they would do this, they would follow the wagon for miles of people would follow it and go by the body to see the body. That was possible. Then they even had to sit it up back then where they'd leave the casket open to sit it up. But his request was, do not bury me until after three days because I'm going to rise from the dead. And that's pretty well documented. My uh, question is, court records was that he wanted the judge to speak to Jesus on his behalf. Remember that in the record? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I had a question. You know, hangings were more or less public events. Then. How common was it that it was closed off behind the curtain? And that, you know, nowadays executions are done in a, a small room and just a, a few people actually get to witness uh, an execution. But when 
when Todd and Hall was hung, did they cover him or did they show No, him? he was he was when Todd Hall was was hung, his was open. Okay. Well, I thought, but in other know. parts of the country and all there are that? only in, in my research and everything, there are only two instances of them putting any kind of a barrier around the gallows. One was Red Fox. The other was Cotton Mounts, who was hung in downtown Pikesville uh, for the uh, Hatfield, yeah. what, the raid on uh, McCoy. McCoy. Randall McCoy's in 1888. And, but the thing of it is, they put just a short kind of wall around it so that if you stood up next to the gallows, you couldn't see what was going on. But at that time, all you had to do was climb 50 feet up the, <laughs> get up the, the tray valley and you could sit and look right in. Get a tray and or a second story on. window or whatever. It Those are the only two instances I have been able to uncover of any kind of barrier or boards built around the upper part of the gallery. Now, with, with uh, cotton mounts, they built it just around the upper portion, not around the bottom like they did with Red Fox. His was completely closed off with a roof on top of it. Yeah, and the thing you gotta remember, there'd never been a hanging in these parts until Town Hall a year before. So there was not, the law and order here came when the industrials came in. They came with the law and order. And, uh, Mr. Holbrook, uh, Mr. Holbrook something he wants to share too. Oh, yeah. Uh, my name's Charles Holbrook. Uh, I'm a direct descendant of John Harrison. My mamma on my dad's mother was his daughter. And I actually was talking with him today, which would be his grandma. And this very thing we talked about, and he said that uh, his dad always said that uh, they didn't really hang him. There was another gentleman in the jail that they used and said that, uh, you know, when they carried him out or put him in the coffin or whatever, actually hung him, there was actually another man that was actually in jail with him. Uh, but that's just what... See, was, was that man supposedly hanging? Pardon? Was that man supposedly hanging? Hanging was the so it's type of law. Right, it's type of law. Yeah, they actually had some law. That's in the white seat. <laughs> so I'll add one more thing to that. Um, after we had been doing this play for a little bit and it was uh, circulating, we got a message from a man who delivered uh, dairy out in across Saline County, Missouri, which it was where. Doc was reportedly uh, went. Uh, and the dairy man said, uh, if you uh, come out here, I'll show you his gravestone. And uh, it, unfortunately, Don and I hadn't gotten our cars going well enough. <laughs> <laughs> so we never made it. But he swore he could take us to M.B. Taylor, Marshall Benton Taylor's gravestone in Saline County, wow. Missouri. <laughs> well, they buried him in an unmarked grave at his yard is what they said. The body, which if there was another body, it doesn't belong, it was supposed to be buried somewhere on the property in an unmarked grave so that no one would come and dig the up. Yeah. See, they dug up, they blew up our own grave four months after they buried him. Uh, he was hated that much by us. We think it may have been my great great. <laughs> <laughs> they have dynamited. That's in, that was in the newspaper. He may have dynamited his grave. So did Doc Taylor did die, or whoever they buried in that casket, they didn't put a stone on it because they were afraid it would be desecrated, just like Ira Mullins did. Right. Yeah, I was thinking uh, to try to sort of talk Frankie into uh, just giving you a little flavor of the play. Um, yeah, yeah. By the way, I was lucky enough to see the 100th anniversary at the courthouse oh, yeah. on the steps. It was awesome. Yeah, it's really awesome. You played Gooseneck. No, Frankie did. You played Gooseneck? Yeah. Okay.
Gooseneck John Branham. Gooseneck John Branham. Gooseneck John Branham. Gooseneck John Branham. <laughs> <laughs> Still got it. I haven't got my neck, neck straightened out yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dudley wanted to read, uh, to do a little something. But I, I was just going to do the other guys, my my bad rendition of each of them. You know, we were it was toward the end of the play when we were talking about things that that happened. And uh, uh, how many of y'all seen the play? Sure. I see you got saved. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, was you the black card fella? I'm sorry? <laughs> was you the black card fella? She watched it about ten times and only goes down. Oh, I... Uh, <laughs> I used to be him. <laughs> I, I, did, I, I used to be him, yeah. I, uh, that might have been Gary. I, I'm not sure. We, we all three had big heads of hair. <laughs> we basically were pretty much ham actors, you know. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, but occasionally we, we, you know, improved a little bit. <laughs> So I, didn't, I wasn't aware of this, but here is the play, and there's a DH for, um, I guess that's Don Henderson, yeah. Don Henderson Don Baker, Baker. Garrett L. Slimp, and Hoyt, my middle name, and that broke up like that. And so, um, now whether it was just um, happenstance, some kind of divine irony, or I don't know what, but they did not cast too much for this show. When Jeff Kaiser, he was the actor that was available at the time, and he joined, joined the Army, and they needed somebody to take his place, and it couldn't have been anybody better than Gary, because Gary was so well trained. Um, I, I I was kind of a storyteller in that I, I like to lie a lot, <laughs> and I, I uh, and so I think Gary asked me, you know, if I would do the show and stuff. So that's kind of, but what was strange about it was that physically, uh, personality-wise, maybe I sort of kind of fit Tal Hall. I, I sort of would have been the one. You said, okay, you should be cast as Tal Hall. And Gary, there was no doubt that he, with this great voice of his, that he had to be Doc Taylor. And then of Don, who was sort of actor, producer, director at the same time, he was the one that was, you know, gave the general picture. So uh, that wasn't intentional. It just kind of worked out that way. I don't know. So Don would go. Now, there had never been a hanging in Wise County, never. But this here home guard decided that now by George was as good a time as any to have one. Gary, it was a better time than most, seeing as they had the famous, most famous bad man in the mountains laying in the jail together. Old bad towed hall, Don. And what with all them rumors about Devil John Wright and his gang of busting talent out of jail, that guard picked up, transported their cells 12 miles to the Wise Courthouse, rigged them up a fort around the courthouse and the jail, and took up a 24-hour watch. Gary, they kept so many chains on poor old Talent. Don, round his feet, me, on his arms and his hands. Round his neck, Gary says. Don said it would have took a, a mule to have moved him, me, a big mule. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Don, and they got him tried, and, um, and they got him convicted, Gary, and that new judge done something that no local judge had ever done before. He sentenced Tal to hang, Don. Right after the sentencing, the guard put Tal on a train, shipped him halfway across the state of Virginia to Lynchburg for safekeeping until the day come for him to hang, Gary, Doc. 
He never took too kindly to all them goings on down at Big Stone Gap. And he didn't care for the idea of having no Pittsburgh at his back door, Don. Don had a, <coughs> Doc had a lot more sense than them fancy fellas that give him credit for. He could see that this here boom business wouldn't mean nothing no more than the end of a natural way of life. Uh, Gary. Doc gave up his marshaling job. Because he could see that this here law and order thing, the only way these fellas had it figured, weren't going to do no more than exchange one bunch of rogues for another. Don, he'd have the big stone gap bunch in place of the mud hole bunch. Don, on top of that, on top of all that, he thought he was going to destroy the mountain. Gary, he'd see it all in vision. Me and Don, warned, warned again, it. warned again. It. So that's, that's kind of the way we did it. But, it, uh, but if, you, if, if you don't mind, there was uh, one little piece that, uh, that my, still my declining brain cells, I can remember. And it's just about Doc Taylor. And those of you who saw the show, you remember this part right here. Well, it was back in 1890, and I was coming across a pine mountain, and over there at that spring at the Scuttle Hole Gap, there was, uh, there was a bunch of rogues ambushed me, shot me up with pistols, cut me up with knives, and they just, just throwed me over in an old laurel thicket, and they left me there for dead. Uh, and when I come to, I sure enough thought that I, I was dead, and I said, on to heaven, because uh, you see, I I wasn't in that laurel thicket no more, and I and I could hear I could hear somebody uh, singing, uh, singing that sweet old hymn, "How firm a foundation ye saints of the Lord." Well, I just laid there for a while listening as. Uh, I'm feeling proud of myself for having made it up to heaven, you know. <laughs> and uh, and uh, then I heard what sounded to me like a, it was like a rocking chair, a creaking. And, <clears throat> well, about that time, that creaking stopped, and uh, uh, a door opened up, and somebody come in, and, uh, and he lit a lamp, and the man come over, and he put his hand on my forehead, and he looked up, straight up, oh, for the longest time. And now, children, I breathe. I breathe good. Next thing I knew, it was daylight. And I could tell that I was in a bed, in a cabin, and hanging from the rafters and all kinds of dried plants, herbs, and stuff. and. Uh, and I'd about uh, figured out by this time that I hadn't died, much less gone to heaven. And, uh, and this fella, he comes in and he asked me how I was doing. He told me I was going to be all right, that the Lord had told him so. Well, I got my strength back. I'd go out there under the porch of the evenings and he'd sit and talk to me, read to me, sing to me, and he'd, he'd read to me. He had a great old big book on religion by a fellow by the name of um, Swedenborg. Well, most of the words are too big for me to understand, but boy, he could whittle them down. <laughs> and he showed us how them words taught that the Lord's holy angels could appear to me, that they could talk to me and help me if I'd let them. Well, oh, I left that man up there in the cabin and in the mountains, and uh, I had seen the Lord's holy angels, and they, they, they appeared to me time and time again. And of all this thing, Doc Taylor for bringing them to me, old Red Fox. I forgot some stuff in it. <laughs> 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 so thank you all.
people are invited. I just want to say something. You know, one of the uh, things about doing this show for so long and, you know, sharing this tale with these other fellas and all, and in, in a sense, it has caused me to learn more about this part of the country where I'm from. You know, I, uh, like a lot of kids growing up, they can't wait to get out of here and go someplace else. For whatever reason, I stayed. And I'm so glad that I did because it gave me a chance to find out where I lived, you know, and where, where I was from. And the show helped that a lot. And, uh, but in many ways, I, I, I've come to think that Red Fox that, and what we did, it's just part of the tale. It's just part of the story. It's just the beginning. Doc was interested in herbs and curing and the healings. Well, the Cherokee and, and, and the Indians who lived here, they'd been doing that for decades and hundreds of years. That's part of the story. The, uh, the industry that came in here that kept growing and growing and growing, and James sings a song about Black Mountain being destroyed. That's all part of the same story. You go through the woods and you find old moonshine stills. Well, now you may find a, a meth lab. You find an old trailer with meth labs in it, you know. The drug trade is no different than the moonshining went on back then. It kills just as many people. So many people kill other people because of it. It's supported somewhat by some big powers outside of this area. And so I, um, I think if old Doc was back, I don't think he'd be pleased. I don't think he'd be too pleased. The, the mountains that he loved so much, you know, uh, it would have been hard for him to get out and gallivant and do his things. Uh, the herbs and all that he that he, he liked to gather and stuff, uh, if they were still here, they'd be hard to find. Uh, <coughs> the uh, So that's, that's that's the way that somebody like me sees things these days. There's a bigger picture, and this is part of it. And uh, but I hope we don't forget this because this is a really important part of it. This tale, this story that we all tell, you know, it keeps us keeps us in the saddle, so to speak. I don't think I've ever said that before in my life. <laughs> <laughs>